Greetings, brothers and sisters. Um, I want to do a brief introduction. I got Jojo Magoo with some hilarious speech and his wife, Jilly Jill, when he had the LSU girls basketball team, women's basketball team, to the White House. Like he had some gaffes. I haven't gone through the whole thing yet, but someone sent me little bits of it. and I, <laughs> It's really one of his, uh, one of his best or worst. And some Trump and other stuff. Like, that's a video this time. Uh, I've been doing that a lot more because the news has gotten goofy. We're going to talk about the debt ceiling thing in a moment. A little bit. Not really that important. But I want to start off talking about not getting mad at NPCs, right? My wife and I experienced something with some NPCs and, you know, non-player character. And, you know, I was thinking about it. And it's... There should be no emotional reaction to an NPC because it's just a machine. And I'm talking about these people, and it's the majority of people out there. They just regurgitate whatever's been put into their machinery, into their software. And they don't have any ability to reason, to make reasonable decisions. And so the, the garbage that's going out into the NPCs from the mainstream media and from their friends and their social media, all these things, is so crazy. It's so, you know, non-logical that, I mean, it's going to be frustrating dealing with them, especially if you're in a position where the person has some power or decision-making authority in your life or whatever it is, right? And you're trying to appeal to their sense of reasoning, but you just can't because they don't have any, right? <laughs> like there's just nothing there. And you really don't care about these people's opinions. I mean, this is how I treat commenters. It isn't like I'm soliciting their opinions or I'm asking for their advice or, you know, their wisdom because they don't have any, right? Like I'm not, you know, and I get people who just show up and leave hostile comments and, you know, they're always not on point. They can't look at me and see me and analyze me and understand me and come up with real things about me. Because they can't read me, right? They can't look at me. And I give plenty of hours of, uh, you know, insight to what's going on in my internal world. Like, I'm pretty open about it, right? Because I don't, you know, people can slam me or whatever. It doesn't affect me. When you open yourself up, people can pick things apart and analyze you and say things or whatever about your, what kind of person you are. And so it's right there for them. Like, I'm not hiding anything, right? Like, I'm not, you know, hiding some aspect of myself. I'm pretty open and honest about, you know, my character fall, faults and, you know, how I think about things. And, you know, I don't present myself as some, I mean, it's a, you know, I present myself positively here, but, you know, I talk about the things I suck at and, you know, I'm pretty honest about negative thoughts. I don't like, you know, conceal these things. So there's hours and hours. I mean, it's a journey series alone, but there's hours and hours of stuff about things that I am, you know, I'm just telling you, and not even like you have to, you know, when you're a therapist and you do some sort of um, assessment measures on people, you're looking for things that people are hiding from themselves. They don't even know about it themselves, right? Never mind, you know, being upfront about it for you. I mean, that's what you're being paid for as a therapist to see things that the person's unwilling to see in themselves. And with a little bit of training or, you know, some natural ability, you can read people. Everyone has the ability to do that, right? You know, I learned that from Saj Marg as a preceptor, and then, of course, being trained as a counselor and just my natural abilities. And, you know, some people are better than others, but it's there for people to see. And as you get older, you should be able to do it better and better. Just know things about people when you talk to them, positive things, negative things. People hide both the positive and negative. They, you know, they, they run away from what's best in themselves and what's worst. They're scared of their soul, and they're scared of the the demon leaking, lurking within, right? And so, you know, there's some hiding of it. But it's not that hard to see it, and at least to get a sense of it, right? Um, what's inside of people. But with NPCs, you know, they've clicked into this. You know, everybody gets into this once in a while. You might be going through grief, or, you know, just you're shut down. You shut down. I've had periods of like this in my life, and you're just going through the motions. You're not even conscious. 
You're walking around like some ghoul, some zombie, whatever, and you're just going through the motions. And you're eating and you're doing whatever. You're, you know, making small decisions about what you're going to eat or not. But there's just no life force in you, no prana. I mean, they, you know, it might be just, uh, in some cases, what I'm talking about is you're, you're having it for a short period of time. But these people have, it's just gone. They've shut down their soul. They're disconnected from their soul. And they don't have the ability for, like, just being alive or conscious. I mean, they're NPCs, right? They're just automated. They just go through the motions of life. And there's nobody home. And, you know, when people live a bad life as they get older, that happens to them. Because they just have gotten so far away from their spiritual path and they're so disconnected from their soul. And their prana, their love energy has been depleted from them and, you know, sucked up by the beast or other people and so they just walk through life oblivious to anything just you know doing what they're told and you know following the you know the the rules as they are into societal rules and they have no ability for any kind of you know being dynamic right they're just reading the script that's been put in front of them and they just you know they've been trained how to go about life and they just do that so they don't have any ability to read you because that's just not a part of their existence so they'll just say stuff like, oh, you're just so jealous, or they just repeat other bumper sticker slogans. And it's a lot of people like that in the truth community. Like, you know, there's, everyone likes to think they're critical thinkers, but just because you don't agree with the official story doesn't mean you're a critical thinker. And so, you know, it's, it's a waste of energy to have any emotional reaction to these people because they're just going to do what they're programmed to do, and that's just the way it is. There's no changing them or reasoning with them or getting them to break free, right? And so in that, I, I got contacted again from uh, Google Ads. I just want to give an update with this. And this girl who, you know, tried to lecture me that I was doing, I should have done Google Ads. Hi, hope you're doing well and thanks for choosing Google Ads for your business. After thoroughly reviewing your account, I've assigned to you a Google account strategist, Armando. Like, she's making it sound like I don't know how incompetent she is. <laughs> like, she's not aware of how incompetent she is and how she just doesn't ever, under, won't ever understand what I'm looking for. Armando, who can help you maximize your potential of your campaigns over the next few weeks, they'll be your main, they'll be your main point of contact to help you with. I guess Armando is they'll. Um, I was a kid named Armando Portal in my, First, second, and third uh, grade class, we were kind of friends, as I remember it. Um, and then he disappeared. It's the only other Armando that I knew. Developing effective campaigns, advancing your campaign based on insights. To ensure a, tra a smooth transition, I've already shared key details of your account with Armando. It was a pleasure working with you. Um, no, it wasn't. Thanks, Jaya. Um, it clearly wasn't a pleasure. It was a contentious relationship, right? <laughs> and, you know, I when I look back at it, I mean, it's hard when I'm, you know, just in such a frustrating situation, but you're dealing with a, a script-reading NPC. But I've been thinking about the whole Google Ads, and it's a big problem because there are, you know, their inability to recognize demographics. And so they don't have anything for spiritual people which seems odd because that's a huge money-making demographic. And they don't have anything for truthers. And so if their algorithms and all the, the information they're gathering and they don't have a way to identify that as a, a target group that you want to put your products or your, you know, in my case, my channel in front of, there's no way for me to, you know, the internet is so vast and people have so many different ways of, uh, you know, um, of being in a, in terms of their consciousness. And so there's all these various demographics, and there's so many NPCs. And if they're running my ads in front of NPCs, then, I mean, my ad, you know, whatever, it's going to appeal or not to people. But to NPCs, it's not there, right? So, you know, people who don't even think there's an apocalypse going on, so it's not going to work for them, right? And, you know, I looked at it beyond my situation, but through my situation, and now my experience, no wonder these companies are failing because they have a huge audience, which is good. 
but everyone's so different in their beliefs and they don't have a, a great way, at least as far as I can tell, of putting these people into marketable categories that they could run my ad in front of a group that would, you know, would be successful. And, you know, that's just my experience, but it's everybody's experience. And so there's no real future. People don't watch ads anyway. They find ways around it, whatever it is, you know, it's a, it's a thing, right? I don't watch TV ads. And so that way of viewing things in terms of products is, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't really have any future. And it's no wonder that YouTube is now suffering financially and having to cut back on its, it's just paying creators less. And so there's no sustainable future for this model. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do, but the way I'm looking at it now is I have to probably just produce less content because, you know, not only does YouTube, um, they punish you for producing more content. So they want more content from you, but the way that they've set things up, when your viewers don't watch all of your content, they unsubscribe them and they stop giving notifications. And so they don't reward you for more content. If you make three videos in one day, they're only going to send out notifications for the first video and maybe a few, you know, to the second video, but I, they're not going to send anything out after that. And the way they do the short videos, I'm having to make a video public, which people get a notification for. And then I, I watch it on my phone and turn it into a short video. And then I make it private again. And then in a day or so, I make the short video public. And then people are like, why did your videos disappear? And so they're giving notifications for videos that aren't monetized that I'm just having to put up because they they have a bogus way of making the short videos, right? Like they should make should they should allow me to make my short video from an unlisted video. But I have to make it public, which sucks. It's just stupid. Because if it was from unlisted, then I could just make it and you guys wouldn't get a notification for a video that's not meant to be seen. People watch it, it's not like in the proper format. Because it's, you know, it's got to be converted to a short video. And so for all those reasons, it I'm being hurt by the amount of content I'm making. People aren't being notified and people are overwhelmed by my content. You know, if I'm making eight, nine hours of content a week, even, you know, the most diehard, you know, people have trouble keeping up with it, right? Um, and so I'm being punished for that in terms of, you know, everything. Um, I'll get more views and more notifications and things if I cut back. And that's why I went to every other, you know, day with my channels, but you know, there's all that. And, you know, it's just not sustainable. So I mean, I, I'm going to continue on like what I'm doing now, but I see in the future, I'm certainly we're doing more farming and my wife has a like sort of a business idea that we'll be working on. I'm just gonna have to take more days off. Like I don't feel burnout, but there are days like I have a migraine, or I just don't feel it or I feel like it's you know, if I feel burdened by the video, like like having to get a video out and pushing myself, you know, and I don't have as much enthusiasm, the video is not going to be as good. And, you know, so I'm just, as t you'll just see less content as time goes on. And I'll be switching to other things and, you know, be better for my channels and, you know, probably better for me. And then everyone can keep up with everything I'm watching. You want to have something to say, like this NPC thing this morning, I can make a short voiceover. But I don't have to, you know, do a long um, you know, edited version of these things and clips and whatever. So, um, you know, I'm going to cut back is what I'm saying. Like, not immediately, but, you know, and I might miss some days here. Uh, but it's just, you know, I think it's better. And, and like I said, I don't see a future in, it's just going to get less and worse with YouTube. I don't have any way now, um, you know, like they've, my the ads was me paying them to do the job they should do as my partner anyway. But since they're favoring CNN and MSNBC and Fox and these other, you know, mainstream crappy things that, that are anti-YouTube and, you know, they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot and they have for a while and they're pushing away people from pushing people away from truth or videos and not recommending these videos, then there's no real way to grow your, your, your audience or whatever it is. I've kind of accepted it. I have a, you know, meeting with Armando tomorrow. <laughs> um, and we'll see what happens from there. But anyways, um, 
let's get into this stuff here. So let's start here with Fish Boy. As you gather with family and friends this weekend, everything is... It's there, right there. It's just... I first noticed it, and now I noticed it, I can't stop seeing it. Um, he's talking about Memorial Weekend. He has these messages. And it shows you how everything's been reversed. And I don't know how this is going to play out. But right now, everything is in Trump's favor. And it looked that way in 2000. 18 and 19, it looked like everything was going Trump's way in terms of beating Jojo Magoo or whatever the Democrats crapped out of their process, their, their DNC process. But then, of course, they did COVID. So we'll see, you know, do they want Trump again, the powers that be, the controllers? And is there anything they can do about it to stop it from happening again? I mean, certainly the, the machine, anything could be rigged, right? Um, but if you, you notice this, Trump is now on the attack because Biden is a failed president, right? The same way that they were attacking Trump. But things are different now, and I'll get into that more in a moment. Let's watch a little bit of Trump here. It's more expensive, a lot more expensive, actually, because of Joe Biden's reckless policies that have caused soaring energy costs and currency. Like, it's just... <laughs> like, if that isn't fish, boy, I don't know what is. The inflation like our country hasn't seen for over 50 years. This Memorial Day gas prices are up 48% since Joe took office. That's right, 48%. Food prices are up 18% airline. It's just so uh, fish boy. But all right, so something that to be aware of. I'm not predicting things. I don't predict them. But how are they going to hide Joe Biden this time? See, they hit him with COVID. And they hid his the lack of enthusiasm at his rallies because they did these social distanced car rallies where people sat in their cars and they, they would do like one every three days or one a week and they hid Joe Biden away on the internet he did some zoom calls and stuff but they didn't have him out campaigning because he couldn't have done it right he just doesn't have the ability to go out and campaign and he's way worse now and we'll see that in a little bit when I show his video and so what are they going to do to hide the guy? And he doesn't look good. Like he's got that Crip Reaper haircut. And when you see him, he just the way he walks, you know, people are going to, you know, there's the NPCs, but everyone else is going to go, wow, he looks a lot older in person. Or, you know, he fell off of his bike. I mean, he, they don't, he doesn't have the ability to, you know, carry out a campaign. It takes a lot of energy and the debates and all the rest of it. So without COVID you know, without a pandemic and a reason to keep him inside, he's going to have to go out and campaign. And, you know, he's going to have his incidences, right? But in his, the DNC, the, the primary for the Democratic nomination, he threatened a guy and said, let's go outside and fight. He called the guy fat and, you know, he called the guy a number of names, right? He was, you know, he, he lost it to a, an NPR woman who asked him about that exchange. He started to get angry. You know, because when you get dementia, you often get angry. And, you, and he's confused by questions. I mean, he's challenging people to push-up contests and IQ contests and all these things, right? And it's going to continue with his age. And now there's a lot more anger towards him because he was just a potential, you know, for Republicans, he was a potential future Hillary or Bill Clinton or Obama who they, you know, they hated for whatever reason. But he hadn't done anything. He was a little bit more uh, popular with Republicans um, than some of the other Democratic candidates. But now he's been president for you four years. So there's the Let's Go Brandon movement. And so he's going to face a lot more animosity. I mean, he just can't do it. And so are they going to do another pandemic? And what are they going to do in 2024 next year in terms of the, you know, the the last six or eight months before they... You know, when they're supposed to be campaigning. Um, and, you know, what kind of crises are going to be there? What's going to happen so they can do some sort of cover for him? Or are they just going to feed him to the wolves and turn it over to Trump again because they want to push more of their liberal agenda or whatever it is? It's just, you know, the whole thing. Line prices are up 41%. Taxes are higher than ever. Interest rates for mortgages and car loans have put the American dream out of reach for countless millions of families. 
Meanwhile, in the Joe Biden economy, real wages are down 25 months in a row. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. In fact, it's the longest streak on record. The typical American family this Memorial Day weekend has lost an average of nearly $7,000 a year in purchasing power because of Joe Biden's failed presidency. You could this would happen if Trump was president, too. There was going to be inflation again. There was going to be a looting process. I mean, just fish. <laughs> and so, you know, you can, you can say, well, he's right. Well, they were going to have to do this anyway. The economy is effed. There's just way too much debt. And there was going to have to be inflation. And it's, you know, they're trying to keep it down. It should be way worse than it is, right? It isn't going to get better under Trump because it isn't a, a policy. It's a systemic problem. It isn't something the presidents do. I mean, certainly Jojo Magoo has made it more negative with all his bailouts. He's exacerbated the situation. But Trump would have had those bailouts as well, the COVID bailouts, because Trump got worked on COVID and shut down the economy. But that was just a, you know, again, a smokescreen for, you know, that was a reason, a something to blame for the economy. They could blame Trump and they could blame COVID, but they can't tell you the truth that the economy's effed because it would create panic. And so, you know. You could take the worst five presidents in history, and they haven't done the damage that Joe Biden has done. Just add them up. But help is on the way. On day one, I will begin to reverse the disastrous effects of Biden's inflation and rebuild the greatest economy in the history of the world, which is what we had. I will unleash energy independence. Again, if we had it, it wouldn't have, they wouldn't have to do COVID. It was a false economy because he deregulated things and made it so there'd be more, you know, scams and more derivative stuff. The banks loved him. But the same thing that happened in 2008 was going to happen under Trump. And it's going to happen time and time again. They need to have some sort of major distraction to keep the illusion of the economy going. So I forgot about this. The Morning Joe had an interview with Federman. Three weeks ago today, newly elected Pennsylvania Democratic Senator John Fetterman returned to Capitol Hill. Federman. He'd been at Walter Reed Hospital since mid-February, receiving treatment for clinical depression. Fetterman. <laughs> Remember that. Suffered a stroke nearly one year ago. He's so awkward. So, you know, we know the guy's a... The, the depression, you know, you... Toughest time in Washington. And he has been open about his struggles with the aftermath. I sat down with the senator in Washington to talk about his tough road to recovery. You've said Joe. that your toughest time was after you got elected to the Senate, which most people would think, hey, that should have been one of the great moments of his life. But that's when your world started to collapse. That's what's so insidious about the depression. The, the depression, you know, you might win and you still feels like you lose. Our family and I, we were through this grueling campaign and- It's grooving campaign. It was a really grooving campaign. Now you've won and now like, what's wrong with us? Or is it not enough for us? You know, why do you- Wait, what do you mean us? It was you, your whole family was depressed. You're the only one who went to the nut house, right? <laughs> feel this way and I, I I tried to explain to them where it's just like you know it, it's different you know you know just because you know w winning doesn't mean that it still didn't hurt well he's no longer Fetterman smash he's like oh, oh, oh. he's just a little whiner right still I laid there and, and watched this hurt my own children because they were confused because they thought just because it's not the word groveling what am I looking for sniveling he's sniveling in this thing he's so far away from Fetterman smash He's Fetterman sniveler now. He's just a he's, Fetterman no longer smash. Fetterman just snivel. Fetterman just snivel. Fetterman just like, oh, I'm sniveling. Because you won. You know, why, why aren't you? You should be happy. Can you talk about um, your decision? See, how can this guy sit across from him? I mean, this is, you know, is he an NPC or is he like just a complete shill and liar? Like that's what the choice is here. You know, I think is a little bit of both. But this guy with the Gumby do. You know, you're watching Jojo Magoo and they're praising him and he clearly is senile. And this guy is not capable. You know, I mean, this dude here, 
as bad as he sucks and the whole thing with Mika and Mika and all everything. And, you know, he used to be a Republican senator or whatever. He was, he's got to look at Fetterman going, how is this guy a uh, prime, you know, uh, he's, he's like one of these um, people that everybody knows about. Like, you can't na- name five senators. One of them would be Fetterman, right? You ask most people to name, you know, one or two senators, Fetterman would be one of the ones they name, right? Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer, you know, who else do you know, right? Dick Durbin, like you know, a few of these guys. But there's, you know, not too many people that have known their, their own state senators, but they'll know Fiederman because Fiederman's been a national figure and he's prominent and he's, you know, the right wing is going after him and the left wing's kind of trying to embrace him. But he's not up to the task, right? He can't do his job. To seek help, to go to Walter Reed. I mean, he's sitting here wearing a suit and this guy's wearing a Carthart, which, you know, I said I appreciate. I, I, you know, this is how I dress, but you know, it's not appropriate for their world view. I mean, they hammered Trump for not being presidential. He's not being senatorial. Like, how does he sit there and pretend this is okay? That this is like you know a legitimate conversation with a legitimate, you know, competent person. This is an incompetent human being who shouldn't be doing anything close to. I mean, he should be sitting on his couch and, you know, uh, whatever. Like he's just a. I mean, his, he could be a couch potato, right? What was sort of the triggering event for you? I'll never forget the, 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 the decision where it, it's like, if I don't do something to claim my life, that this could be, you know, tragic. I was skeptical. You mean suicidal? You are going to commit suicide? He was going to commit suicide is what he just said. Uh, you know, and I was, I was, you know, kind of like, no, no, I don't really belong here, or whatever. But I'll you know, give it one last chance. Now, as he give me one last chance, seeking help for depression, his wife Giselle tweeting after what he's been through in the past year. There's probably no one who wanted to talk about his own health less than John. I'm proud of him for asking for help and getting the care he needs. You just said talked about being skeptical that you could get help. Could you talk about, I think that's an attitude that men may. It's, he's on meds, right? Like now he's on some heavy duty meds. Like they should tell what medication he's on and talk about the side effects of it in terms of your, your eventual mood. A lot of these antidepressants make, you know, have you know, suicidal ideation and, and depression are part of their side effects. So it can make things worse. You can get better at first and then make things worse later on. And it also can distort your vision of reality. And he already had trouble listening to people. He said they sounded like when Charlie Brown listened to adults. And so, you know, they should list his, his medications, his psychological medications, like all these people. The medications are on. You should know the medications are on because it affects their, it impairs their decision-making process. I mean, again, they're not real. They got handlers to tell them what to do. So that's the, you know, that's the thought here. But if he was actually a senator making decisions, he's on heavy duty, he's on Prozac or Cymbalta or some of these things, right? I mean, it's just, you know, you can't do your job properly. It, it warps your reality, right? It's like somebody who's a drug addict. They have even more than women. Men don't seek treatment as much as women do. This isn't a matter who's tough or who's not. I'm a little, you know, I have the blues or I have a little... Mel- He's had the blues. <laughs> he had the blues. Melancholy and and I would just beg men, you know... For, you know, for sexual favors. <laughs> you're not too macho, you know, it's no big deal. You're The only thing, person you're really going to hurt more than anyone else is you're actually your family. That you- is exactly. There's no person you're actually going to hurt actually more absolutely he's married to me absolutely he's married to me absolutely he's married to me absolutely absolutely you're going to hurt your family that's the one person you're going to hurt more than any other person is your family cuz you know that's how it works absolutely get inspiration from people like lincoln and churchill who's <laughs> 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 okay, let's listen to that again. That was great. Family. 
Did you get inspiration from people like Lincoln and Churchill who struggled with depression yeah. their whole lives and yet fought through it and changed the world? I would say there's almost kind of like a nobility to it. Like, oh, no, come on. Or, or suffering, you know, there's some nobility to that. Or, you know. Everybody suffers, like everyone gets depressed. Everyone has moments in their life where it's just a natural phase in your life. You're going to go through grief. You're going to have, you know, everyone's going to have disappointment. It's just life. And so it's just the way that you're, you're going about it. I'm going to stop here because this is great. And I'll continue this. On. I got so many other things to cover here. But I'll continue on from this point, uh, you know, in a couple of days. So I'm not going to show you this till next time. Trump loses millions and faces criminal charges. And Lawrence O'Donnell, the Pamer guy. I was going to show you those today, but I want to get to this thing with Jojo Magoo. Okay, so um, here's the LSU women's basketball team who won the national championship. And this is Jill Biden here. Hello, everyone. Go ahead and sit down. <laughs> so Jilly Jill, why is she speaking, right? She's never been a politician. She's been a politician's wife. She was a babysitter and an 18-year-old girl who was married to another guy when Jojo McDo swooped in and stole her away, right? Because um, he wasn't, you know, getting enough from the kids at the pool of rubbing his legs so <laughs> when he was a lifeguard. Um, but she's goofy, not smart, and, like, she's becoming worse and worse. I showed you something either on my other channel or this channel a couple of days ago where she was begging for applause. And so this happens... I'm so proud to welcome the 2023 NCAA champions, the LSU Tigers, to the White House. Woo! Woo! What are they dropping the camera? In this room, I see the absolute best. Wait, who's this? What position does she play? Best of the best. Jasmine Carson, who led the team with 22 points, going seven for seven in the first half. Woo! She's remembered her stats. She's a fan. <laughs> Angel Reese, who broke the NCAA record for double doubles in a season. Woo! Okay, okay, Dr. Jilly Jill. Um, I know you have a doctorate in education and all. Can you explain what a double-double is? Because <laughs> you're such a great basketball fan. Why don't you tell everyone what a double-double is? She wanted to invite the Iowa Hawkeyes who came in second to and got in trouble for it. Alexis Morris, who led with... Okay, she goes through the things here. She, she says something else here. And just played. I thought about every little girl who will come after, how you show them that they belong on the court, that they can be strong and tough. They can be strong and tough like you. That they can fail and fall down. Take you know, just like your husband who's always fallen. Like he falls up the stairs, down the stairs. <laughs> he gets back up and he falls again. Risks and run until their legs feel like they will give out, then run some more. That they can win. You didn't just play basketball. What did you do? Who's this guy right here? They're all posed, this guy. How'd he sneak in? You didn't just make history. You showed us, girls and boys, women and men, what it means to be a champion. <laughs> Some big giant hand just came up here. Um, you know, the, the Angel Reese who she mentioned was mocking one of the other players, and that caused huge controversy on the other team, right? Um, it wasn't like gracious in, in victory. Like, I don't care about it, obviously. But there was controversy. Um, Jill is so stiff. You... Yes. Woo. Woo. You gave us hope and joy. Okay, so let's move to Jojo Magoo here. Kamal gets in here for a little bit. Everyone's getting in. Our president, 
the United of the United States, Joe Biden. Woo! All right, here he goes. Nineteen presidents. <laughs> All championship teams. I think this may be your. Uh... So first he mumbles to them, and nobody can hear because his microphone's over here. Then he turns around. The champions that have captivated the nation with their talent and their heart and their grit. You know. Uh... Their wit. <laughs> what did their wit have to do with it? Uh, we're joined by members of the Louisiana delegation, T Troy Carter, Garrett Graves, Mike Johnson, and uh, a lot of alumni, too. We have proud alumni of Louisiana. Okay, let's move forward here. And Coach, uh, like I said, uh, you're Hall of Fame, man. I'll tell you. Man? Hey, man, you're Hall of Fame, man. You're going to be the man's Hall of Fame, man. It's, uh, I, I, isn't this getting old for you, winning all this time? <laughs> the Hall of Fame championship coach had a... Has he ever won before? ...vision. Nine new players joined in the one pop team. He started the season five straight 100-point games. Continued into the record 23-0 and zero run. 23-0 and zero run. <laughs> like, you don't even know what you're saying. Like, he's just... Roll through the regular season with the best in the nearly 20 years. And under the big, one of the most exciting final fours ever. Winning LSU's first national championship basketball title. So then why, is she, why are you saying you're getting tired of winning? Like there's a guy who, from Coach Connecticut that won like, I don't know, 15 titles or something. It's crazy, right? And I know South Carolina's had a number of wins a couple of years or so whatever it is. Um... LSU's first one. He's like, yeah, we're tired of winning, man. Come on, man. Angela Reese, uh, excuse me, Angel, you, uh, you named the most outstanding player. It wasn't any reason. It didn't surprise me. Uh, uh, demand for uh, you know, I don't, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> because so high, you, 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 you caught, you know, you made it more expensive for people to come. <laughs> and the cost of tickets went up 10 times. Ten times, and uh, more than the men's games. The final was the most viewed game in the history of women's basketball. More viewers than the, than the NBA playoffs. And folks, we witness history. And here's what else we saw. Parents and children who watched every single one of your games together. This guy escaped from the 80s? Like, is he, is this a time traveler? <laughs> Sometimes driving 10 hours just to see you play. And then, and then we've seen you take the time to talk to them, to laugh with them, to show millions of our daughters they can do anything as well. Anything. You know, in this team, we saw hope, we saw pride, and we saw purpose. It matters. It matters. It matters. You know, it's been 51 years past time, guaranteeing all women and girls equal rights to participate, not only in sports, but in any school program. Today, 58 percent, and this, uh, my colleagues don't like me always mention this, but 58 percent of all college students are women, up from 42 percent. Woo! They're better not college students anymore, woo! Not athletes, in college. Uh, Not just athletes, in college, all together. So I'm in the editing process. I, I did this um, this morning, this, you know, the first part that you're watching here. And then I'm editing after doing a lot of beautiful day. I've got a lot of uh, farm work done today. And I was thinking about this while I was doing my work. And, you know, there's a couple of things here. And you'll see it more as it develops. It gets really goofy. He gets really goofy at the end uh, with the... Um, you know, where they're fake fans or something, but they know nothing about it. The basketball, in this case, um, you know, they talk about it like they're fans and they might watch the game, but don't really understand it. Or, you know, and they invite people in and whatever group they're talking to, whatever place they're from, like he talks about how great LSU is and Louisiana is, right? And, you know, um, somebody's from... Uh, uh, Baltimore, which is a real pit, right? But that's in Delaware, where he's from. They, um, you know, they kiss the ass of the people they're saying, oh, you're, you're the best college, you're the best, you know, whatever, right? 
whatever team it is, whatever sport, whatever it is. And they don't know anything about it. Like, they're not real fans. Everything with them is fake. It's all staged. It's hard to get through, uh, all these things. But not with JoJo because he's just a, a dope and somebody passes out here for a little bit. Like, it's gonna, a bunch of stuff happens here. Um, and, it's, and it flashes in and off, on and off the video that I was watching. For whatever reason, the, it's like there's something wrong with their camera, or so there's a lot of chaos going on here. But they come in and they pretend that this is the greatest team and the greatest people. But in that, he just said, like, this is all about women and women's empowerment in sports. And then he says, you know, women are, uh, whatever it was, 56, 58% are, you know, it's more women than men going to college. Everyone's applauding, but that man, it means men are going less, right? Like, why is it everyone wants men to fail? Like, is this, <laughs> especially with the Democrats. You know, I never had this competitive sense of, rooting for men over women. Like, I never even thought that way, right? But if you're saying that it's 58% women that's going to college, great, that's great for them, but that means it's only 42% men. And, you know, women are becoming more educated than men, and men are getting a, you know, taking a beat down, like in all these things, right? Like this, he, and he craps all over men. Watch how much he he talks about women being better and women can do everything men can do in sports, which isn't true. Like, he gets into all this stuff. And it's, uh, like, so bizarre because if you're propping up one group, then you're crapping all over another group, right? You know, like, especially in a... And when you're breaking down the percentages like he is. Now about 10 times more female athletes in college and high school than there were. Millions more women are getting sports scholarships and a chance not just to play but to earn degrees and build their lives. But there's, uh, there's more progress to make. There's more to do. In the media, 95% of sports stories are still about men. Yeah, because men are better at sports. <laughs> like if the women played the men and won, that would be a great story. That would be You would be the best. If women, let's say the women's college championship team played the men's team, and beat the men, that would be a huge story. And you could say, all right, let's talk more about women because they're better than men at sports. If that were to happen in some future, whatever, especially now with the way that things are going with the definition of men and women. But right now, men are better at women, better than women at sports. And so it's a better game, right? I watched the WNBA. I watched a playoff game maybe a week ago. I think it was the Lakers and the Nuggets. I'm not sure what it was. And there was a WNBA game afterwards. And that uh, that woman that was uh, it was in Russia, forget her name, don't tell me, don't care, don't need to know, um, was returning. So they were broadcasting. And I was like, all right, I'll watch. I was like getting tired. I was about to go to bed. I was like, I'll watch a few minutes of it. And it was the worst basketball I've seen in years. I mean, there's bad basketball games for men. But there was like, you know, I watched five minutes. There was like four or five turnovers. They were just throwing it to nobody. And, you know, lots of missed shots, missed layups. And, but just sloppy, unathletic play, right? A lot of fouls. And I was like, wow, this is horrible. This is not like even high school level. Like a good high school team, of a boys high school team would win, right? And that's, you know, that's not prejudicial or misogynistic it's just fact right in sports there's a winner and a loser you compete and there's levels to your play and you're you're a little kid there's little league and there's levels to play and you know but there are sports that like women can play i watched women's tennis when i used to watch tennis and there wasn't that much of a difference between women's tennis and men's tennis the men hit harder but they were competitive games but it didn't look sloppy and, uh, and awkward and unathletic there's lots of sports like skiing and women's gymnastics is more popular than men's gymnastics maybe even you know better like in terms of what they do and there's sports that that women can do that you know there isn't that much of a fall off when you're watching it right like you know whatever it might be ice skating figure skating things like that right where you know there's things that that actually women do better or it's more entertaining to watch the women do it um, 
probably golf. You know, I've never seen women's golf, but like you're not there to measure how far the ball goes or whatever it is. And so, you know, when you're watching it, you're like, oh, this isn't so much worse than what the men do. But basketball, there is. There is a huge fall off, right? Women's beach volleyball, you know, because they wear bikinis, but it's a, you know, it's more popular than the men's, right? There's lots of sports where well, the women's sports are, you know, comparable in viewership to the men's sports, but basketball isn't one of them. There's a, and the football wouldn't be one of them either, right? There's a, in softball versus baseball. There's a huge difference in what you're watching in terms of the skill level and the game. And you can't, you can't make that up. You can't pretend that, you know, because it's a competition. You know, there's a winner and a loser. It's not an issue, though. <laughs> not with this team. <laughs> Folks, we need to support women's sports, not just during the championship runs, but the entire year and every season. Showing up in person, watching on television, creating more programming and sponsor and scholarships and sponsorships and opportunities for millions of women and girls to realize their dreams. So why, why would, why would we do that? Because you say so like, this is what you're choosing to watch in terms of your entertainment. Right. And if people watch it, they watch it and there's a market for it. The WNBA there's, there just isn't, it's not entertaining to people. And so, I mean, you have to make the thing better, like, you know, you need better players. You need a higher quality product. No, they can do literally anything at all. You know, I just tell our daughters. Our Except for dunk. <laughs> like, <laughs> and make and shoot a high percentage. And daughters, they can do anything at all. Anything any man can do. America is all about possibility. There's all these breaks in this thing. It's poor quality. But, um. No, they can't do what a man can do on the basketball court. And anybody watching it would see that. That's what this team is about. Incredible athletes redefining what's possible. And one more thing. We're hosting the UConn's men's basketball team later today. And uh, they're the men's champs. <laughs> Somebody faint? Somebody fainted? I didn't know this happened. Folks, it's okay. Forget. He's so good in a crisis. Is this one of those stage things? There's this thing that they've done. It's done by Trump, Obama, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, um, uh, the San whatever his name was uh republican politician santorini whatever his name was uh, uh don't tell me don't care don't need to know but I've, I've got it somewhere i have to find it i think it still exists on my youtube channel i can copy it again i did a compilation of it and it's all these politicians where somebody faints and they offer them water it's completely staged it's something that happens over and over again and it's a show that the guy can handle a crisis some water. See water. They always ask for water. That's their thing. Like somebody faints and you want to drown them. <laughs> they always ask the person if they need water. Try to look like they're in command. He's just clueless. He's not. He's not able to pull it off. Um, I have to find the thing. Something. It's somewhere on my channel. He's so clueless, he doesn't know what to do. Like, uh, you know, I don't think this is staged because he's not prepared. Um, did she have a heart attack? What happened here? I'll, I'll put this up on my other channel and find out what happened to the person. Still going on here. Still going on. There she is there, sitting up. Woo! Folks, uh, the uh, I, I know uh, it's time to move on, but uh, the one thing uh, I understand, I started to say later this afternoon, I'm going to be with the Connecticut team, the men's team, and. Um, your cousin wants to have a one-on-one. -on -one. 
I'm putting my money on you, kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You, you okay, now he's getting creepy. Okay. <laughs> She's like, okay, get away, creepy. You know that? She, she got, a, she got a, a, a cousin who starts on another team. I think, it, what's his name? Hawkins, something like Jordan. that? Jordan, you think, maybe? Yeah, Yeah. well, we got, we, got, we got a bet going in our inside. The, so we, there's a basketball court down below. Um, okay, she's not going to beat her cousin because he's a man. Like, she's not going to beat him. <laughs> You know, it's just, I mean, and she knows it, right? Like, you know, I mean, it's a, there's just a difference in physical abilities. It's not because women are inferior, it's just a physical thing, right? Men can't have babies. Like, it's just, you know, you're designed a certain way. In some species, women, like a praying mantis, a woman praying mantis is like four times the size of a man. Oftentimes that's the case in the insect world. Sometimes the the, the female is bigger and stronger and superior. The, you know, female bees, for example, you know, male bees do one thing, they reproduce. And once they, they do, they die. Um, you know, so there's elements like where the women species and some species, the women is superior physically. But in the, in the mammalian model and in the human model, that's not the case. It's not a you know, it's not a, who cares? It's not a big deal. Like, it's just, but stop pretending that's not the case, right? Uh, you think I'm joking. So we're going to work something out here, right? Yeah. One-on-one. -on -one. I have Angel. Yeah, I got Angel, too. <laughs> 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 and besides, I got Secret Service to make sure Angel's going to win. <laughs> so that's pretty disturbing, right? <laughs> so first of all, you don't think you can win what? Because she's a woman. And... It's important for her to win and beat the man down, so you're going to abuse your Secret Service's privilege. And the Secret Service are going to rig the game for some reason because it's important she win because why? Why is that, right? I mean, so senile and lame, but, you know, why is he pitting them against each other? Like, he's bringing the men in later. He's going to talk about how great the men are. And, you know, the men's basketball is superior to women's basketball. And it's not a, you know, nobody would dispute that. The women couldn't compete with the men. It's just a physical superiority in terms of athletic ability and physical strength and size and all these things, right? And her cousin would beat her if he tried, if it was a real game. And so why? Why would you even, you know, okay, why would you instigate such a thing? You're the president of the United States, right? You know, Bob Costas did this. Years and years ago, there's a guy named Ben Johnson who beat, um, wherever that guy's name was, uh, in the 100-meter dash. And they tabbed Ben Johnson for steroids. And they found out he'd been using steroids, and they stripped him of his medal, and he was a disgrace. He was Canadian. And Americans had won the 100-yard dash since forever. For since you know before I was you know born like it's been a, a long this has been a long tradition Americans produce the fastest man in the world and so they took it away from Ben Johnson but then um this guy Donovan Bailey who was another Canadian he won the hundred yard hundred meter dash or whatever it is and um, Michael Johnson won the two hundred meter and Michael Johnson was celebrating he wore gold shoes and he was sort of the darling of that Olympics. And so Bob Castus comes on and says, wait a minute. He looked at the times, uh, Michael Johnson for 200 meters, he divided it by two, and his time was faster than Donovan Valley's 100 meter because the slowest part is getting up to speed, right, in anything. When you're in a car, when you're in a, I mean, it's the initial uh, force to sort of get you going from a standstill position, right? And at the end of the race, you're flying and you're running your fastest. And so Michael Johnson was not nearly as fast as Donovan Bailey, right? But Bob Costas created this controversy and said, Michael Johnson is really the fastest man in the world because he was an American. And, you know, that was just the position Americans always held and since uh, Usain Bolt, right? Um, and so he, so because of that, they decided to race these two guys. It was a big money event. 
and Donovan Bailey crushed him. I'll show you the race. Michael Johnson pretended he was hurt, pulled up lame because he was getting beat so bad. Donovan Bailey wasn't used to turning, right? That's the when you do the hundred meter, you don't have to turn. But when you see, you watch him come out of the turn, he's already ahead of Michael Johnson. You knew it was over. You can see he's bigger and he's you know faster. <laughs> and so um, Donovan Bailey mocked him for pulling up lame and faking like he was hurt because he was getting crushed so bad, right? But Bob Costas did the same thing as Joe Biden here, and he created a, you know, a duel that wasn't fair. Created a, you know, a match. You know, he's, you know, like Angel Reese didn't say she wanted to play her cousin, and her cousin didn't want to play her, right? And he's just making something up because he's like senile and stupid and he's so weird, right? And, you know, she's going to get crushed if they play. If his, if her cousin tries hard, you know, he probably won't because it's, you know, everyone knows he should win and will win, right? But it's just, you know, pathetic. And it's this whole idea about women being superior, but then he comes in and says, hey, uh, you know, if, if you can't win, I'll make sure the Secret Service break his legs. Like, what are you? <laughs> um, and then he's going to go, you know, kiss Yukon's ass later the same day and tell them how great they are. It's just so, you know, it's just so weird. I tell you what, between a brother and a sister having two stars on championship ball clubs the Cousin. same year, it ain't bad, but they're all around the Baltimore area, right? Yeah, that's my family. All my family's from Baltimore. Baltimore, as they say. Anyway. Oh my God, that's just so bad. Great. Um, he's saying he's supposed to be saying Baltimore. He's doing it with an accent. Thank you all again for your for your patience for being here. Look. Um, yeah, I mean this sucks. I'm glad you guys can all sit through this this horrible thing we're doing. There's an awful lot, <laughs> an awful lot to be proud of, and uh, and the way in which. When now he's off script, so this is where he gets goofy. Sports has come along. It's just incredible. And you're, and you're changing the name, and it's not just in it's across the board, in every single thing. And uh, it's really neat to see since uh, I've got uh, four granddaughters. We, we had some pretty good athletes. No, you don't. You got more than that. You forget about the crack baby. He's got like six. He's definitely not talking about his son, Hunter's uh, stripper crack baby again. Not anything saying bad about the girl, but father's a crackhead and mom's a stripper. He's not talking about her, and then there's another one he's not talking about. Athletes, I wasn't a bad athlete. My brothers weren't, but all the real athletes in this family are women. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you, you got it. You got it. Any rate. <laughs> he's just like, look at this guy. What's he? <laughs> so then he gets creepy with her here, the coach. By the way, that does he's going to pull her in tight. Doesn't even count the new fashion line she's going to come out with. <laughs> you might want to use that. Do I have to? No. <laughs> no. You can use this if you want. It doesn't matter. You can leave if you want. Anyone well, as you, as, as, as you can see. Look at this. Look at it. Look at the sand. He's getting gropey. We leave our mark where we go. Samaya <laughs> planned that. No, Samaya's fine for those of you who are Okay, then they got this. It's unfortunate with the video here. I should have found a better one. But... Okay, it, it, he gets into the thing here. He comes in here. Now he's going to get gropey. By the way, one thing Look, he gets in there. Louisiana is dangerous. You know why? Our daughter was going to go to school where her brothers went to school. She decided to go to Tulane. <laughs> and I was worried. And is she that guy down there, Landrew, the former mayor? Uh, I know a thing or two about his father, Moon. I don't do it. And his father, Moon, is a hell of a guy. <laughs> it's just so bad. 
and took care of my that moon. That his father Moon is one hell of a man. Daughter, because I was worried she's come home with some boy from Bio Lafouche or something, you know. Yes. And I was talking funny. I couldn't understand. He's got the creep color. He's got the creep keeper, the crips keeper mullet here. And you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Nobody knows what you mean because you're, you're talking gibberish, Joe. Joe, you're speaking gibberish now. Nobody knows what you mean. We still speak the French language. Uh, but that part of Louisiana hasn't washed away yet. I know. Well, none of it's going to wash away. And besides... Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Just another big storm. Uh, it's an incredible, incredible state. But anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. We are honored. All right, so that was just, that was wonderful. That was epic. That was just across the board. So one more thing, uh, my wife, I meant to say this in the inter introduction. So my wife told me that she woke up in the middle of the night and I said m and -er seven or eight times in my sleep. <laughs> m and -er, m and -er, m and -er. <laughs> And she just started to crack up. I, just, I used the full, I'm abbreviating it here, but I said the full thing. So apparently there are a lot of M and Fers in my dreams last night. But anyways, there's a lot of them in my waking hours too. Um, only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely important for the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.